Welcome to another episode of the podcast uh, here on the Jimmy Rex Show. I am with a special guest today. This is Garrett G., a uh, good friend of mine. And you might know him from probably from the Bucket List family, but some of you know him from his days on the Shark Tank. Garrett, welcome, man. Thank you, my man. I'm, uh, I'm shocked I caught you in town, actually. <laughs> so yeah, it worked out. You've been on over 100 flights in the last two years. Is that correct? Last two, 182. 182 flights now in the last two years wow that's incredible yeah that's incredible more impressed I, we got because we got two little kids they're the real champs well i flew one time um, my brother dale was taking his three little kids with him to new orleans for a basketball game it was mm -hmm. when jimmer was in the sweet 16 for byu <laughs> yeah and it was one trip for three days doing that and i was like i don't think i need to travel with kids ever <laughs> so for me like i literally was like one trip i don't know how you is that the hardest part of like your travels now is just the fact that you uh, have i mean there's you're not just you and your wife going you've got a family to yeah no i maybe at first but now i mean our kids are champs like it could be i mean our last flight was a 12-hour flight from portugal oh wow and the kids get on the flight they get their snacks out they get their you know their games and entertainment they order a little bit of orange juice and they're like good yeah, I bet everybody's like shocked at how well your kids probably handle planes now because they're just so used to it. Oh, right? all the other passengers are just like, who are these kids? Like, you know, <laughs> how do they know this? So, That's awesome. Awesome. Good. Well, so you, um, your story is fascinating. Um, I met you about probably four or five years ago now, uh -huh. I guess. Uh, and immediately upon meeting you, I realized like, okay, this guy has something special going on. Back when I met you, you just kind of launched your scan app. Mm -hmm. and But I want to back up a little bit before that because you, well, to tell your story real quick, you sold your app to Snapchat for over $50 million, mm -hmm. and he essentially decided we're gonna go travel the world with our time now, now yeah, that we don't yeah. have to work, right? Um, so tell us though, before that, like you were going to school, you were in school when you came up with the idea. Please kind of just share with our audience kind of how that came about and... Um, sure, so let's see, I was a freshman at Brigham Young University in Utah. Um, I was playing on the soccer team, and I was studying product design. And the tough thing about product design is, if you have an idea for a product, and you design it, it's gonna take years to like, get it to market. That was tough for me. So what I figured out is like in the world of software design and apps, you can have an idea, you can design it, and a day later, weeks later, like so much faster, you can get an idea to market. And that really interested me, made me excited. So I decided to like take my product design skills and try to design software, try to design an iPhone app. And I had a bunch of ideas like, what I would consider really cool, unique ideas. And then I had one more uh, lame idea. <laughs> okay. And that was to create a barcode scanner. <laughs> and though I call it a lame idea because, I mean, there were already so many barcode scanners out there. And the idea was simple. Like, I want to download a barcode scanner that looks good and is fast. Mm. But all the other barcode scanners on the market were either slow and sluggish or they just were ugly. And I was like, you know what? I have all these cool ideas. I'll start with my lame idea. That'll be like my tester to like get my hands dirty, yeah. learn some skills, and then I'll move on to my cooler ideas. So together with two buddies, built a very simple app called Scan that would scan barcodes. Wow. So that's how you came. It was literally the ugly child in the <laughs> room that you ended up. <laughs> it's awesome. And so you and your two buddies started the, the app. And then I, please, you've told me the story before. It's so funny, though, when you first launched it and kind of you went around literally person to person Let's getting say, people yeah. to sign up. It was it was at a party because we, we launched the app and I was so excited to see something that like I had dreamt up yeah. actually be live in the app store. So it was that night at a party. And I guess my parties just are not that cool, but there was like 12 people <laughs> okay. at this party. But I went around and made sure everyone at that party downloaded my brand new app. So I was all proud, like I got 12 downloads. So the next day when the three of us got together, I was like, yo guys, like I hooked us up. I got us 12 downloads <laughs> on the first day. And they were kind of chuckling at me and they pulled up the analytics on the computer. And uh, our very first night we got 2,500 downloads. <laughs> and that's when I realized like, oh shoot, I can, I can try to sell this all day, but the app store, like build a quality app and it'll market itself. Wow, and so how long did it take before? I mean, you guys just immediately took off with downloads. You got your first million and how long did that take? Oh dude, we, we, we hit a good wave and first night was 2,500. It doubled to 5,000 the next night, doubled to 10,000 the next night. And uh, it continued to do that until it was between about 70 to 100,000 downloads a day. Wow. 
And uh, I mean, it wasn't very long before we reached our first million. Yeah. Well, I remember when you went on Shark Tank mm -hmm. um, and they asked you how many people had downloaded the app. Uh -huh. And I, I, I can't remember the number. It was millions or whatever. And their faces just like their <laughs> jaws just dropped. Like, wait, how many people have this app? It was good. It was good. I think at the time, too, not a lot of software or apps had been on the show. Mm. And so for us to roll in with about 100,000 or 100 million downloads by yeah. that time. Yeah, it was good. Yeah, that was, what, that was my favorite part of the whole show. Well, my favorite part when you went on is you, you walk up in sandals and they're kind of <laughs> looking at you. <laughs> and yeah. now it's like if you Google the episode, it's the one, it's their biggest regret of all of them that they didn't take is, uh -huh. is the app or whatever. But. Yeah, I've seen a bunch of those. Uh, a, f a couple have popped up on YouTube of like, where are they now on Shark yeah. Tank? And like top 10 biggest regrets. And uh, a, a lot of, uh, sometimes Shark Tank will like, track you down and mm -hmm. do like follow-up stories, mm -hmm. but they haven't done one with us. Interesting, well, uh -huh. probably because nobody w was smart enough to <laughs> invest with you guys at the sure. time, but. Well, so back up a little bit before you went on Shark Tank. So you got, the downloads are coming, um, I mean, immediately are you monetizing it or kind of how, because, and this was your first business you ever started? Is that, was this kind of um, the first thing you'd done or what had you done before that? I'd say technically it was maybe my second, I'd kind of, it was my second business I started. Before I built Scan, I was um, running a company I called Capital G Design, okay. which was just freelance. Uh, I'd build, design logos, build websites, just for, at first it was family and friends, and then started doing it for businesses and more legit clients. Um, so yeah, I was doing that freelance, but then Scan was my first, like, my own thing. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. And so it... I like give us an example of like when you knew you had something special because it starts was it that first night right right well I mean I've always like been optimistic and I thought it was going to do well but maybe it was coming from a small town like I didn't know what that meant yeah <coughs> excuse me no worries because when we thought up goals it was let's try to reach a million downloads total okay let's let's try to sell it for five thousand dollars <laughs> Dreaming big. What was the third goal? This is so small, I can't even remember yeah. the third goal. So, I mean, but those are like our big things. And I remember being like, I don't know who's going to pay us for $5,000, but that would be sweet. That's like <laughs> pretty good money. And then uh, and then million downloads, like, I don't think we'll achieve that, but I'm not going to like be the one to stump our goal. So, like, yeah, let's go for it. And then, I mean. It just took off. Uh -huh. And so, um, after you went on Shark Tank, that, did, is that when you kind of started getting reached? I know Google and Snapchat reached out to you. What happened after that, or what was the process to getting Scan to the well, point where you sold Scan, it? Scan had an interesting life, because we ran the company for three years until we sold it, and, and something really interesting happened at the end of each year, because at the end of the first year is when we raised a seed round. We raised $1.7 million from Google, some founders of Facebook, Menlo Ventures, like some really prominent names in Silicon Valley. Okay. And I think that's when it first like legitimized us and like, oh, we might be doing something like for reals here. Yep. That was at the end of year one. And we heads down, kept working, kept working, and then Shark Tank came around. And at the same time that Shark Tank denied us, some other investors believed in us and they poured $7 million into us. Oh, wow. Okay. So, so that was at the end of year two. And then it was at the end of year three that we ended up selling it. Gotcha. And uh -huh. Snapchat acquired you for the technology as much as anything. Or, or my, tell us a little bit, what was that like? What, what was their interest? Because wasn't it the uh -huh. technology for the facial recognition and some of that? Or so, how did that work? Um, if I were to try to like sum it up best, I would say Snapchat understood very well that they have um, second to maybe the standard iPhone camera. Okay. They have the most used camera in the entire world because you know, maybe people are opening up Instagram and open up Facebook every day, but they're not taking pictures within the Instagram app. Most of the time, people take a picture with a different camera and then post it to Instagram. Sure. But Snapchat's unique. Like, if you're posting to Snapchat, you're taking the picture with the Snapchat camera. Mm. So Snapchat understood, we have this most used camera in the world. How can we make it more powerful? And, you know, there's facial recognition, there was scanning, there, there were all these things, and they saw us as the leader, the go-to source for everything scanning within the camera. And so that's, yeah, that's when they came to us. Wow, that's genius. Well, I, I love it, I love it. And yeah. so um, after that, I mean, it was probably, you know, you had uh, some time, you had just made the sell. How did you decide what to do next with your family? And it's one thing that I think is really cool about what you did next is it really was able to 
build a business, but using <laughs> your using that quality time of family and your kids and your wife. I mean, you guys are true partners in this new adventure, and you can tell that as you watch the videos. But how did you guys decide what you were going to go do next? So, so a funny story. I'm trying to think if I've ever told anyone this, but yeah, maybe like my wife and like five other people know this story. But when uh, when Snapchat was acquiring us, it was right before my senior season of soccer at BYU. Mm -hmm. Because while I was building Scan, I continued going to school just for the love of soccer. Mm -hmm. I mean, I wasn't spending much time in classes or anything, but I was, I was playing on the soccer team, and I wasn't ready to like give that up. I understood very well like. That's the time in someone's life. If you're a young athlete, like you're not going to get that back. But then Snapchat came along and said, like, here's an acquisition for over forty million dollars on the table. But one of their like um, stipulations, yeah, was I needed to to quit soccer right before my senior season, right before my favorite, like most important season. Um, I needed to drop out, and it was on the phone with the CEO, and he he kind of like put that out there. And not giving it too much thought and just more following what was in my heart, it was, well, then I'm sorry, like, we don't have a deal. I'm going to go play soccer. And I hung up, and then immediately, like, I think I was, I, I, I talked to my, my partner, my co-founder, and he knows me very well, so he wasn't, like, yeah. judging me or anything, but he's like, Garrett, I understand, like, <laughs> money's not your motivation in life, and you have, like, some, like, well-rounded, like, values. But you need to understand that you're not the only person in this deal, and you need to make the deal happen, you know? <laughs> and um, Im immediately I was like, dude, what am I thinking? Like, you're so right. I wasn't thinking. I was just following my heart. I'll call him back. So I called back the CEO, and I was like, all right, I'll quit soccer. I'm in. And so that's when the deal went down. And it was, the deal went down and was finalized three months before my final season of soccer. Okay. So I told the coach I'm quitting. I moved out to LA and I joined Snapchat. And then a super weird turn of events in the universe that, that worked out my way without, without me like meaning to do this or trying to do this. Um, I, actually, I, I ended up leaving Snapchat after three months. And no joke, and not on purpose, but I ended up leaving two days before the senior season of soccer kicked off. Mm -hmm. And so when I quit, my wife's like, well, what's next for us? What are you going to do? <laughs> and she's like, I mean, is it an option for you to go back and play soccer? And right then I was like, oh my gosh, what's the date? Like, and I figured out, like, this, I got two days that I could go back there. Yeah. Called the coach. He was like, we'd obviously be more than happy to have you back. And I flew back that next day for, like, tryouts, mm -hmm. you know, um, to kick off the season. And uh, anyways, the, the universe and the stars aligned for me. And ended up playing my senior season. Well, I remember with our group of friends that you know we used to get together once a month or once uh -huh. every couple of months and have like networking meetings and discuss ideas and stuff. And I remember we went to one of your games your senior <laughs> year, and so I just was like, wait, I know this story is coming back <laughs> because I, I went to one of those games. So, well, so it was cool. It was cool that um, like I, I I thought my heart was in the right place and wanting to like savor my youth and play soccer and then. And I was like, you know what, I'll sacrifice it for the team and we'll sell the company. And then in a roundabout way, I was able to play it anyway. That's pretty awesome. That's a great story. I mean, you truly did follow your heart like mm -hmm. with those decisions and everything else. <laughs> and I think there's a value in that. Like you hear of some of these athletes that are, you know, college football players, for example, that mm -hmm. decide to stay another year at college. And you really can't replicate that uh, yeah, yeah, in yeah. life. Uh -huh. And so like people are like, why didn't you take the money? But, you know, it's not a lot of times people aren't motivated by the money because you understand that money doesn't bring the fulfillment but totally, like totally. that experience of college and well and sometimes maybe one of the most questions i get asked especially from young entrepreneurs is like should i go to college or is college necessary and for someone who has like a real like hardworking, proactive naturally entrepreneur like or entrepreneurial like maybe college isn't necessary for them but my advice is always the same like dude just go to college and like try it out just for the fun of it, like go, enjoy it, have a good time, don't worry too much about class because it might not be that helpful, and then go do your entrepreneurial well, thing. Well, that's what I tell people, the same kind of advice. I say, look, college is about networking. Yeah, yeah, Like right? go meet friends, go make lifelong totally, friends because uh -huh. you never know where that's going to take you, mm -hmm. right? Like if I hadn't gone to college, who knows if me and you ever crossed paths. Exactly, Some of those guys exactly. that I met, you know, that ended up with our paths crossing totally. or whatever else. So, well, and so after soccer, um, 
you guys, I mean, I think you were trying to think of some, a way you, you explained to me that you wanted to still kind of do something with the family, but like a business and right. so tell us about that. That, that. That's something I wish everybody in the world, I mean, this isn't realistic, but like in the ideal world, everyone would have this opportunity to have the worry of money taken out of their life. Be like, what do you want to do with your life? Because that's when it gets real. It was really fun having uh, like these conversations and discussions with my co-founders who were in the exact same situation. Right. We all got the same amount from the acquisition, which was enough that, I mean, unless you're crazy, like <laughs> you, you, you don't, you don't have to work, you don't money, have to right? work again. Yeah. So it's like, well, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? What about this? What about this? We just had some good conversations. That one of them was, you realize like what matters in life. Like, okay, I have so much, like I have all the money in the world I would have dreamt of, but if I don't have my health, like, then what? Or if I don't have a strong marriage, or if I don't have, you know, there's like those certain things that like can take a very wealthy or rich man yes. and just make their life meaningless if they don't have their ducks in a row. So, oh, yeah. one, it was a good time to be like, where am I at in life in these other regards? And then it was like, okay, well, what's my passion? Like, what do I really want to do with my life? And um, a lot of my thought process was like, who in the world are like the happiest people? Mm -hmm. And I thought of pro athletes, because they get to play their sport and that's their life. Yeah, the I thought of uh, fitness people, or especially dancers, because I think they get to perform and that brings them happiness. And with athletes and dancers and fitness people, like anyone who gets a, anyone who like health is a really big part of their career, I think could have a really good happy lifestyle. Um, and then uh, travel. Travel is a really big passion of mine. Anyway, so in uh, considering all of these, um, it came down to travel. And the reason why that became what, uh, kind of my next, my next venture, my next move above the rest, was because it would enable me to include my family. Mm. Right? So It's a perfect combination. Yeah. Well, in travel, I, I travel a lot. I've been to over mm -hmm. 40 countries. Nothing like you guys. But, you know, I'm getting there one day. But... My favorite part about traveling is it just opens your eyes to such a different, just all these ideas and things that you would never come across. Like even business ideas, every time I go to another totally. country, I see something where mm -hmm. my, I'm just exposed to a new thought or a new idea or just new people, right? Mm -hmm. And it's, it, I think it's the best form of education you can possibly ever have as well. Totally. And so I think you know, it's such a perfect fit for you. I bet you're growing more now through your travels and through spending this time than anything else that oh, you've done. Oh, for sure, for sure. Myself personally, and then just also our family as a whole. And that's what we talked about, my wife and I, when we, when we started, it was like, well, we don't feel like we're grown up enough to like spend our money on a house or spend our money on a... Uh, you just sold your company for $54 million and you're like, well, we're not grown up enough to buy a house. <laughs> yeah, so we, we, it just didn't feel right. Like it didn't feel right to buy a house or cars or whatever. So we decided like, let's, let's do the opposite. Mm. Let's do a hard reset on life. We're going to sell everything, live out of suitcases. And we're going to do a trip around the world and we'll see like, maybe we'll find a place that we want to settle down. But most of all, like, hopefully we'll learn from different cultures along the way, and that'll tell us how we want to, like, then proceed with our future. That's amazing. Well, I remember when you sold all your stuff, I came over and I bought, bought, my desk. I bought your desk. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. We're actually doing this in your sister's <laughs> basement tonight because you literally don't have a we home now, right? We are homeless. When we're in Utah, we're living in my sister's basement. <laughs> <laughs> I love it, dude. It's, it's really inspiring, I think, to people that are listening and um, cause so, I think so many people, especially with millennials nowadays, you see so many people, I bet you've had a lot of people reach out to you saying they want to do what you're doing mm -hmm. or want to copycat what you guys have mm -hmm. created because the idea of traveling and getting paid to do so, but explain a little bit. Cause I think a lot of people that want to be influencers online or want to have something, what you have like a YouTube channel, don't understand the amount of work that you're <coughs> truly putting in. I can appreciate it cause I realize how much effort goes into all of what you're doing, but explain a little bit about kind of that side of the traveling. Right, right. Well, there's a lot of sides to it because like, just say specifically, if you're gonna do like social media influencer type of stuff um, and you wanna do it with travel, that means you gotta have, you gotta have photography skills, you gotta have video skills, you gotta take the time to edit, and that's all just like to create content. Yeah. And then you're gonna be competing with all the other content creators out in the world. So there's that competition. And then there's like the business side of it. like. It's really interesting because I'll meet influencers or social media peeps that have well over a million followers 
but like can't pay rent and can't afford. Like we'll reach out to people and be like, hey, you want to collaborate? You want to do this? And they're like, yeah, but I can't buy a plane ticket or I can't do, you know? Yeah. So just having a big following doesn't mean you're going to make good money because then there's like the business side of it. And luckily with my past business experience, that helped, you know, just kind of know how to, how to navigate that part. So before we ever left on our bucket list family adventures, uh, there's outdoor retailer. It okay. happens in Utah, right? Mm -hmm. So it was like the week before we left, I went and just kind of hustled the entire show, going up and down the aisles, meeting with every booth I could, trying to figure out like, hey, will you guys sponsor us? Will you work with us? I mean, at the time we had, not exaggerating, I think we had like two or 300 followers. Yeah. So ever, I mean, everyone said no. Tiva was the only company that said like, I like your style, like what you're pitching, your following's too small, so I can't sponsor you, but why don't you take some free sandals? And I was like, that's it. <laughs> that I'm, was I'm your sponsor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? <laughs> um, but it was cool because as our following grew, continued to hustle, then a lot of those companies then came around about, Back, you know? Yeah. I mean, and now we're, we're sponsored by our dream companies. We're sponsored by Airbnb, by GoPro, by Southwest Airlines. Wow. Tiva's like an official sponsor now that we love, you know? Um, and, and I think maybe the thing I'm most proud of when it comes to the business sense of this is we make enough that I've replaced my income that I had at Snapchat, you know? Yeah. Like, it was scary to leave Snapchat and not know, like, this is a big salary. As, like, a leader at Snapchat, am I ever going to be able to, like, replace that or yet, better yet make more? And, uh, and we've done it. All right, so through these travels, I think a lot of people, you, ha you get asked, I'm sure, a million questions through your following online now. You know, you've got this big following, you've got the sponsors and everything else. What are the most common things that you get asked about that maybe people don't understand about the traveling? And what's the, what's the hardest part? What's, and what's the, been the biggest reward of the travels? Um, I'd say from like an outsider's point of view, when they see us, they're like, man, you're living the dream. You're seeing so many countries and you're traveling all around the world and like that's definitely awesome but I think what people don't understand is like as a father as a young father I'm getting to spend 24 7 with my kids doing really cool experiences and activities learning new things and like I think that's the most unique that's definitely what I'm most grateful for because I mean, yeah, as a young dad, not a lot of people get that opportunity. Yeah, I think just that quality time too. It's like not even the quantity is the quality, but it's also exactly, the quantity, exactly. you know. Yeah. And so your kids are gonna be those kids in school that like they'll be learning about something and every time they're gonna have the answer and the teacher's gonna <laughs> say like, well, how do you know that? Oh, I've been there, you know? And they're no, gonna start we, thinking they're making stuff up we, or something. We joke about it. We almost like don't want our kids to be those like stuck up pretend. Yeah, just, sure. We took my daughters to ski lessons the other day. And the teacher's like, have you been skiing before? And she's like, yeah, just one time. And she's like, oh, cool, where'd you go? Like, Colorado. Norway. <laughs> no, she goes, in Dubai. <laughs> and I was just like, oh, like, just, just tone it down, you know? That's hilarious. So, yeah, I love that. I had some cool stories. I, I mean, it's unique that my daughter's first day of school was at an orphanage in Bali. Um, my little boy who's like, loves animals and is learning all the different animal sounds, I mean, he like, learned what sound a line makes by like seeing a line yeah, you know sure. like it's, it's been cool that's pretty amazing so speaking <clears> of that you guys have a charity angle you and your wife uh, right. jessica that you've started a um, couple different things you have the pin pals mm -hmm. um, and then you've started working towards um, the human trafficking side mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about that for our listeners and kind of talk a little bit about i don't know if you're familiar i work with our and so i also <coughs> kind of oh, cool. help handle that yeah. trafficking side but tell us what you're doing you guys are building a school in in nepal and a couple other way cool so things. when we uh actually going back to the uh, acquisition and selling the company to to snapchat so we got the money from the acquisition and we decided let's not touch that we don't want to just like splurge and so a lot of people will make this mistake they think that we're just like traveling on our own dime mm -hmm. and going crazy with the money that we got from the acquisition. But the truth is we have not touched a single dollar from the acquisition for ourselves. Amazing. We, when we started traveling, we started traveling from the sale of our belongings and two vehicles. And, um, and now we've, we've, uh, we, we do it from sponsors and right. you know, we actually make money to travel. Yeah. <clears throat> so we did, what we decided was we would only spend the money from the acquisition if it was for humanitarian projects, charity, or to, to help others. And uh, yeah, I mean, 
you travel around the world and you will just see opportunities all around you to do good and to help others. And uh, luckily we've had some really like big opportunities come up as well. One of them was when we were traveling in Nepal, we were with a, uh, a nonprofit called Effect. And uh, they taught us about the, the, the tragedy of human trafficking. And it really took a heavy hit on my wife and I. Um, they said, they're like, you'll be depressed for like a couple of days and then you'll kind of get over it and you'll be ready to like hands on and help, you know? I don't know if we're just weak in the soul or what, <laughs> but it took us like a long time to get well, over it. I saw your videos, saw. emotional video. Oh yeah, we had tried to film this video and we had to like shoot it multiple times because we couldn't like stop crying. And I, I don't like cry that much, but uh, it, it just really, it may be because we have young kids and you know, with my daughter, that that's why it was really difficult for us. But we decided, like, all right, let's let's do something. Let's try to help. And what they've discovered is one of the best <clears throat> one of the best ways to help these girls is education. Because if there's a school that gives them surveillance and that gives them somewhere to go that's safe and that gives them that protection, but also it gives them the education and the confidence so they can uh, avoid human trafficking. And so uh, we raised, together with our community and following, we raised fifty thousand dollars to build a school, which just this last April finished. It's up and running. It's full of students. We got amazing teachers there. And uh, yeah, that's that's running over there in that part of the world. We haven't been able to visit it yet, but um, hopefully hopefully this upcoming year. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. I, I would like to, once we're you know off the camera, we'll talk some more. I'd love to help with that and It'd help you really guys cool. with what really you're doing because I think it's an awesome project. And Thank that you. really is like, that goes to show a little bit more of <clears> that <throat> education side is really the most, one of the most important things somebody can have because right. just like you said, it gives them a routine, it gives them a confidence, it gives them somewhere to go, it gives them mm -hmm. um, an actual education mm -hmm. so they don't have to go. Because trafficking in those other parts, it's a little bit misunderstood sometimes. It's not like these kids a lot of times are being kidnapped they're being lured with right, promises right, right. and things uh -huh. like that exactly. right is that well and when people say because i mean it's, it's funny because we just got done saying like uh oh, college maybe it's important maybe it's not but we have like we have all these resources yeah we have we have you know we can like google anything we have the internet or we, ha we have mentors and amazing people and parents and but then you go over there and it's like no they don't have like running water they don't have electricity like some of the girls like they went missing and they would go to their family and be like, we want to help you. What does your daughter look like? And they didn't even have a photo of their daughter. Like, mm. It's just like such a different level there. So to build a school where they have just that first degree of literacy, literacy and education, like, that's life changing. No, that's awesome. That's mm -hmm. awesome. Well, I want to circle back. Speaking of education, mentor and all that, mm -hmm. you get asked, I'm sure, by all sorts of <coughs> things. Cause you're young. You just turned 30. Mm -hmm. um, you obviously had a ton of success at a very young age. What do you? What are some examples of some things that you have learned from your experience? Because it's such a unique experience. Not many people even could ever teach what you have. But to younger people and people that are just starting out, what are? Give us an example of something that you just try to always share with people as they reach out to you as a mentor. Um, I think one of the most important things is to to have a real skill, like a marketable skill, because I mean. If, if, if you want to go and get a job, like that's going to make you the best hire and that's going to like provide for your family. But especially if you want to be entrepreneurial and you want to do your own thing, the entire journey of building your own project or pursuing your own venture is going to be easier if you have the, like, the, a, a skill that can help you build it. I mean, that was, that was the secret sauce for me is when I wanted to build an app, it wasn't like, oh, shoot, I got to go find someone who can build it for me. Yeah. I had the... the basic coding skills and the, and the high level design skills enough that I could like build it myself, show it to someone, be like, yeah, you want to team up with me? And then they made it better and then we could take it to the next person. I mean, when it was the three of us, um, we, we built the app up to millions and millions of downloads, right. just the three of us. And so, especially because we were young, like it didn't worry if, or it didn't matter if we weren't getting a paycheck because we were just doing it off our own dime, building it. It was just felt like we were doing it for fun. Yeah. Um, whereas if somebody does not have that skill set to pursue whatever venture they're going after, then I mean they're at a you know they're at a disadvantage from the beginning. I love so that would probably be the first thing would be uh, yeah having having that skill set. Well, and a follow up question to that with your partners because <coughs> so many people have bad experiences with partners. Right? I myself, my first partner I ever had did not go well. I ended up <laughs> with 120 grand debt. Um, 
and he was on drugs. That's literally took our money yeah. and s snorted up his nose a lot, <laughs> you know. And so how did you find such great partners and what advice do you have for partnerships with people? Or give some example of how you knew they were the right people to partner up with. Man, I, I don't know how much of it was like good intuition from me and how much of it was just pure luck, but they were just the best of the best. Not only were they very skilled and just great like business partners, but just like good, solid guys. I mean, I was the young, naive one, and so th there were so many times in so many ways they could have taken advantage of me, uh, maybe overexposing myself. But one example is I never knew and I never had access to our financials. Oh, wow. Like, I always just trusted my co founder being like, like, am I making as much as you? Like, and I never asked him that question, but I just always like hoped, like, or assumed, you know, he's a good guy, I trust him. At any time, he could have screwed me out of the entire business. Even when it came down to the acquisition and they like pulled out the cap table, it's like, so you have this much ownership, you have this much ownership. I was like, it's news to me, but I'm <laughs> grateful, you know. Like, wow, that's really, that's really unique and awesome that I you think. had such great partners. I, that was one of the mistakes that I made. I was 24 and I was just on the hustle, right? Mm -hmm. I wasn't doing the details. And we were, we were in my mind, succeeding as a company. We'd grown our company. We had, it was a door-to-door -door meat selling uh -huh. company. But, and all of our money kept disappearing. I was like, well, where's our money Shoot, going? Man, yeah. I didn't know. And I went back and looked and he was taking about two grand a week that who knows where it was going. And, <coughs> you know, that was a Same. large portion Same. of the profit. And that's one time when I'm like, I would not give people the advice to follow me in that respect. I think people should be more yeah, careful sure. because I think I just got super fortunate. But it, it, the goodness came round about because during the acquisition, there came a time when they reached out, the Snapchat asked me, they said, look, we have this much money. I can't remember if it was like the employee option pool or what, but it was a good like $3 million. And they said, what do you want to do with this? And I was like, what are you talking about? They're like, well, as CEO, you get to decide like, you can take this all for yourself. You can take 50% and give, you know, divide up the rest. Like, you get to decide. And luckily, luckily, I didn't give it too much thought. I just immediately was like, oh, I just divide it up equally amongst ourselves. And, they're like, and, they, and they had told me, like, nobody will know about this. Mm -hmm. It'll be, you know. So I replied to the email and said, just divide it up equally. And I don't, like, I don't think it's too much credit to me because I don't remember giving it much thought. I don't remember being like tempted. Yeah, it just, just was like, the right thing to do. It was just kind of like my initial reaction. But the email, when I said that, that was supposed to be secret forever. Oh, yeah, yeah. This crazy, <laughs> crazy craziness happened where uh, Snapchat had their emails hacked. Oh, yeah. And then we got all leaked out to the journalists, including that email. And when my co-founder saw that email and was like, I mean, he, d he didn't know that that even happened. He didn't know that that was a decision. Sure, that, that was a... But, you know, he appreciated it. Wow, that's pretty awesome. And, uh, yeah, it's just kind of... Well, it speaks a lot, a lot to you and kind of who you are as a person. I think that's been the reason that... Because so many people try to do these travel vlogs and things like that. And I think one of the reasons why yours has been so successful is your genuineness, your family. People really are... Can see into that with you guys. And I think that you're just a fun family to follow because of that. Um... I, I, for one, like that's why I watch it because so many people are just trying to show how cool they are or whatever else. That's not what you guys do. In fact, you show a lot of the mess ups and things like that. And is that by design that you show kind of, you don't try to make it look too fancy, yet it's like it's very well done, but you show like retakes of shoots and things like that all the time. I did. Uh, I remember when we did our first video, I remember telling my wife, like, I think we should do it first thing in the morning right when we wake up. Yeah, I remember your first video. Because I think if we try to look good and we try to look cool, we're just going to come up short. <laughs> People will like see through us and be like, no, they're not that cool. So I was like, let's just let's, let's go the opposite direction and just kind of look like a wreck. And then people will be like, no, it's first thing in the morning. We'll give them a pass, you know? <laughs> so we, we still, every time we shoot a video, we'll be like, fresh out of bed, looking like super muggy, yeah. and we'll do it then. No, that's great. Well, the last couple of minutes, sorry, I want to do a couple rapid-fire travel questions. I know <laughs> you probably get these all the time. I wanted to make this more <coughs> about the journey and so entrepreneurs could kind of get a yeah, feel yeah. for what you've done. But there are some fascinating things about traveling to, how many countries is it now in the two years? Uh, so I, I myself have been uh, over 70, but wow. together as a family in the last two years, we're at 49. 49, okay. Mm -hmm. So favorite country so far? Dominica for me. Dominica mm -hmm. and why? Um, I think part of the reason, because I, I had no idea it existed. When we were on our way there, I thought we were going to the Dominican Republic. <laughs> That's hysterical. And then we arrive and I'm like, oh, it's a different country and it's called Dominica. <laughs> so I think that was part of it. But geez, like if you're in the Caribbean and you check out Dominica, it has 
the beauty of the water and the wildlife in the water that you might find in like French Polynesia. Okay. But then, I mean, most of the other Caribbean islands are just kind of flat and desertous, but this is just mountains and waterfalls. A lot of movies were filmed there because uh, it hasn't been super touristy. Mm. It's super raw, which I really like. Um, Love but that. just such unique. Land. I mean, I think Pirates of the Caribbean. Okay. Um, well there. There. Mm-hmm. I don't want to ask like the worst country you've been to, but which is one where you don't <laughs> necessarily think you'll end up going back to? <laughs> we have a couple of those. Um, no hard feelings against the country <laughs> itself. Yeah. We just had a bad experience in Antigua. Okay. <laughs> So we probably, I don't know if we'll go back. Okay, Antigua. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is it something you would share? The exp- was there anything in particular or just in general? You just uh, not really worth nothing sharing. Nothing else to say. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. Well, and I reached out to you a few times because I went to Korea and I was like, I had watched your yeah, blog yeah, yeah, about yeah, it. Uh-huh. You know? I was like, hey, give me some advice about Korea or whatever. Did you have a good experience in Korea? I liked Korea. I wasn't there long enough. So okay. it was, I was meeting up with some friends in Hong Kong and Macau, China. Uh-huh. Um, I had some business buddies doing some stuff out there, and I just always wanted to go. Right. And so they couldn't go the first few days, so I flew to Korea by myself, oh, right, right, spent right. a day and a half, and then I flew to Vietnam to go to Holong Bay. Yeah, yeah, I'd always yeah. wanted to go cool. there, and then I met up with them. So I didn't get quite enough feel uh-huh. for Korea. I'll say this. I want to go back because um, I think Seoul has a lot. I just went to Seoul. Right, right, right. Uh-huh. But you went to a couple. I mean, you went to Seoul. Were and you I there for say, a full week, or how long were you? I mean, speaking of Korea, of all the different cuisines and foods we've tried around the world, Koreans are very favorite. Y- really? Of yeah. all of them? Korean barbecue. I got the wrong stuff. I went to a <laughs> event. Oh, well, that night, I didn't really know what to do. I was by myself, so I went to a baseball game, and it was just pretty awesome because <laughs> cool. the fans just they have cheerleaders? Nuts. Oh, yeah, the whole section. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, crazy. Yeah, yeah. I've never seen anything uh-huh. like it. Uh, Americans need to pick up on Korean baseball oh, totally. cheerleading, uh-huh. by the way. It was amazing. And uh, I got some Korean barbecue there. Um, but it made me sick, and I was throwing up. And it's too so bad. It's too I know. Bad. I was like, uh-huh. I bought the like cheap food at the baseball game. But um, well, and do you know what a Korean spa is? Have you experienced that? Yeah. So you just get the whole experience, and it's, it's quite. You can tell us your experience. Well, okay. So I mean, we're big fans of the Korean spa, and it yeah. sounds that if somebody isn't familiar with this, they're probably going to listen and be like, "This guy is super creepy because it sounds <laughs> creepy." Yeah. But once you experience it, you'll understand. It's life changing. So. Typical Korean spa, and you can find a few good ones in America. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, it sounds weird, but you go in, and then it's just, it's like entirely nude, right? Right. Take off all your clothes, and then you go into, and it's like this communal area, so there's a bunch of other, there's like a guy section and then a girl section. So if you go into the guy section, you're going to see like a bunch of open showers, a bunch of open baths. They're typically going to have like a hot, hot bath, a medium bath, and then freezing cold bath. And then sure, you've got job to go in there, and you just go like, dipping from pool to pool uh, in the different temperatures and then you're supposed to like scrub all the skin off your body like and it, it's basically you just get like super clean and yeah, you like pamper sure. yourself coming out of my mouth it sounds super weird <laughs> no, it's, but you go there I, and it's, it's, it's life changing for a few different reasons because like it's just like almost like uh, like meditation there's like something like spiritual about it and then when you take someone for their first time and they're like super nervous and scared about being naked in front of so many other people. Right. But then they leave and they just have this like new perk to their <laughs> walk and this new confidence being like they just accomplished it. And it's just really funny. So now we have this weird thing where if our friends haven't been and like they're our favorite ones in LA called the Wee Spa. Okay. So we'll take them there and uh, sure enough, they're nervous going in and then they have this new shiny confidence well, walking out. That's great. It's like high school sports on steroids, right? right. Like it's share a shower or whatever. So well. Korean, I mean, Korean's got a lot going on. It's one of our favorite cultures. Yeah, well, your video from that one is the, one of the reason I reached out to you. I was like, hey, you guys seem to have a really good time uh-huh. here. But anyway, um, what's, I, I, do you have a goal to hit every country eventually or what? what's the plan there? I, I think so. Um, just 191, kind of the, I think that that's right? just my competitive side. Um, I think the youngest female to travel to every country. It's like 22 or something like that. Um, we actually met her. Um, but Your my, kid's going to do daughter, it like nine years old. Well, I mean, yeah, my daughter's five and she's been to, oh, you know, of the... 191, 196 right? is I think the number. Okay. And so she's a quarter there. Like, I bet I could get it by the time she's seven. <laughs> So we'll see. That's awesome. Uh, no, that's great. Well, dude, I know you've, thank you. I know you've been sick, so your voice is a little bit yeah, raspy yeah. tonight, but sure appreciate the time. My, my voice is usually not this manly. So. No, it's great, <laughs> dude. Well, your story's inspirational. And, thank you. Um, thanks again for letting me reach out. It's good to see I you. I appreciate again. it, man. All right, man. Thank you.